On this episode of Step in the Arena, we get to the bottom of why my co-host calls our podcast Step into the Arena. We'll also talk to some guy that played in the NBA and a journalist that loves superheroes. Stay tuned. This guy has made it through rounds playing the style that he plays. He named every one. It's like this guy named all five of my game winning shots from 2008, 2009. I played with two of the two of the most exciting players ever to play the game. Allen Iverson and Vince Carter. I'm Bobby C. That's Edgar Burgos. You are tuned in to Step in the Arena on the Cruise Control Podcast Network in collab with Hard to Guard Media. We appreciate those watching live on Twitter. As always, you can like, download, and share our podcast on Spotify, Apple, SoundCloud, and of course on YouTube. Mr. Burgos, how it goes this eve? <laughs> What's up, Bob? How you feel? I'm doing all right, man. Trying to have some fun here on the podcast. And uh, I think for me, that's, you know, as, as great a guest list as we always have. I was curious why you just can't seem to say our podcast correctly. Step into the arena because there's two of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's two of us. So we, we're both stepping into the arena. The arena. Yeah. Well, I think it works. I think it works. You know, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, our, our producer, Randy Cruz might might uh, not agree with you, but I could see I could see why you go that direction. Randy Randy cause, uh, stays yelling at me all the time. I say his name wrong. I say the, the title of the show wrong. He's like, get it together, man. <laughs> well, you know, as I mentioned in the opening, we definitely have a great show for our fans tonight, and we wanted to bring in our first guest. As much as I know, all the fans love our banter back and forth here to kick off our shows. So without further ado, we wanted to bring in Robin Lumberg, who is with us tonight, senior host at SI, talent for CBS Radio and Mad Dog Radio, and of course, the New York Post podcast, Full Court on Flatbush with Kerry Kittles. Robin, how's it going? I guess I just uh, stepped in the arena. You are in the arena now. <laughs> yeah. Not in, I didn't step into the arena. I stepped in the arena. Rob, how many jobs do you have? <laughs> Uh, I got I got one full time job SI Monday through Friday and then yeah I uh, I work some other jobs too like, <laughs> too, too many sometimes but you know like I, I like to say this to people I, I can't really complain in this day and age about being overemployed I, I feel a little bad about that if I do so well you know Robin I I don't know if our fans at home would be confused about you know which one the first guest might be if you're the NBA guy or the superhero guy. But uh, I'm pretty sure that it's probably more the comic book thing, right? You'd be the uh, guy. Yeah, I mean, I would t- no. I mean, I think it's uh, it's NBA, uh, Jay Z, and superheroes. Yeah, like uh, hip hop stuff and 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 Marvel. Th- those would definitely uh, be the 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 triangle offense, if you will. Of I my uh, my I know, third I know, to start. I know Ed wanted to talk to you a little bit about Jay Z. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to say how happy are you that he got nominated to the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, I mean, uh, obviously he should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's the, the greatest ar- artist in any genre period, you know, of all time. Not just not just rap, but, you know, he was already in the, the Songwriters Hall of Fame, right? Uh, Hall of Fame home. I, I hope I did it all without a pen. Uh, you know, I know you heard it before, but I got to remind you all again or whatever the exact lyric is for that. But, I mean... It, 25 years is what's crazy to me about that. I think that's the uh, the classification. Reasonable Doubt came out 25 years ago. You know, I really got into Jay-Z. I would say, I, I remember it was volume two. I was in high school and all those records would knock in the, the school cafeteria, Jigga, you know, and I remember going and, and getting the CD. I remember getting in, into my dad's car and my dad was like, you sure are listening to a lot of rap lately, uh, you know, after I got that CD. But it was from there that I went back and, and I listened to uh, – Volume 3 came out, like, right after that, so I was into that. But I went back and listened to Reasonable Doubt. I, I went back and listened to, to Volume 1. And when the Blueprint hit when I was in college, when first yeah, – Dynasty came out the same day as Stankonia, I believe, when I was in college. And then Blueprint came out. I had a 95 Ford Escort. I would blast that, that joint – uh, endlessly in the 95 Ford Escort. You know, the rest of those records came out in, in college. Black Album w- was huge with that that Beatles uh, remix album. That, that I, I don't think there's ever been an album that was remixed as much as the Black Album was. And then, you know, uh, up until this point in his career. But w- what's um, crazy to me now is 
you know, when when Kingdom Come came out, you maybe had some of those doubts, you know, and, and was the flow choppier or was he going to be the same guy? And he bounced back with, with American Gangster. He's bounced back since then. And and really from that 444 phase till now, there's like a new version. It's like a new prime, I would say, for him. And, and every verse is kind of like an event. And and the the confidence and perspective he speaks with and, you know, the the uh, actual, you know, verbiage he uses. I mean, there's there's nobody like him. I mean, it's 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 he's the best rapper um, ever. He's the best rapper alive. And he's somehow getting better. How many concerts have you been to? I don't I, I couldn't tell you the count. I mean, it's it's got to be it's got to be 10 somewhere in that range. Right. I, I mean, I remember I, I saw the Blueprint tour at the 930 club in DC. That was really cool because it was an intimate venue. Uh one of the my favorite shows was the All Points uh was it All Points West was it called? It was a festival um over uh Liberty Island. And oh, yeah, yeah. it was unfortunately right before uh MCA from the, the Beastie Boys passed. Um they had just announced that, that he was sick and they were supposed to headline and Jay stepped in instead and it had rained that whole day. And it was just like a muddy, disgusting mess. And he opened with no sleep till Brooklyn. And that was a moment. I saw him shortly thereafter. This was all around Blueprint 3 time at the Garden. Uh, and that was the, he brought everybody out at that. Rihanna and, and Kanye and John Mayer to do like You Don't Know and Dirt Off Your Shoulder on the guitars. I saw some of the, the opening uh, concerts at the Barclay Center. And I, I went to the first B-side show. Um, I, I was a title member. From the beginning, so as you know, I'm a real home stand, right? That's and, that terminal five, right? Uh, what's that? Terminal five was that mm -hmm. at terminal five? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I w and I was right there for that first B side show. So those are some of the the ones that 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 stick out. I also saw the Eminem one, uh, the Justin Timberlake one. That was great. I was yeah. there. That one, yeah. So Robin, if Jay Z was an NBA player, which NBA player would he be based on his career in the rap game? It's interesting. I mean, it's either Michael Jordan or LeBron James. I, I you know, he he would say, you know, Michael Jordan. Uh, don't worry, I'm not the. Uh, don't worry, I'm the Mike Jordan, the Mike recording. Of, you know, you Kobe baby, Tracy, uh, Tracy McGrady. Matter of fact, you a Harold Miner, Jared Ryder. I washed up on marijuana. Even worse, you a Purvis Ellis. You know, worthless fellas. You ain't no athlete. You Sean Bradley. And I know, uh, but you know, I, I also say like the longevity aspect of it is the LeBron part. Like the OG aspect of it is Jordan. Like the guy, like. For, you know, I'll be the the Jordan fan forever. Like you never, you can't say anyone's ever been better uh, <laughs> than, than Michael Jordan or, or Jay Z. And then I think there's the LeBron aspect of it. Of you know, like LeBron's the MVP favorite right now in year 18, which is just crazy. And and Jay Z's still going at, at this point. So I I mean I, I think that the stock answer would be MJ, but I, I could also make the the LeBron comparison as well. I wanted to keep the conversation here with the goat talk. I know that, uh, you know, the Super Bowl now is a few days old, but we're still talking about it a bit because of what Tom Brady was able to accomplish at the age of 43. I love this question that you posed on SI and asking whether this was Brady's most memorable Super Bowl run. So I wanted to turn the tables on you and ask you the same thing. For you, is this the most memorable Super Bowl run that Tom Brady has made? You know, it probably is when you when you take the whole thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's his most memorable, you know, play. He, there was no game that I watched in that run and going, oh, Tom Brady's the reason they won, or this is the best Tom Brady game. Like, if you were to say, like, what's the most memorable game? I mean, you could always make the argument one of the ones he lost, Philly Special or to the Giants, right? But um, I would say from the, the winning standpoint, it's the 28-3 to comeback. Like, when, when he came back 28-3, to they came back in that Super Bowl. I thought, all right, there's nothing else he could possibly do to add to his legacy, right? But this was the other – this was, like, the only possible thing – he could do to add to his legacy, which was go to another team away from New England. So I, I think the fact that he switched teams, the fact that there was like a weird, you know, like a more personable aspect to him this year, starting from when he broke into somebody's house and was arrested at a park or something. I mean, he wasn't arrested, but, you know, kicked out of a park <laughs> early in the year and, and all that Florida man behavior. And, uh, you know, up until the celebrations and everything and, uh, you know, just – Doing it with another team and, and and getting that seventh, I think when you you encompass all of that, um, you could easily make the case it's it's the most memorable run. Did you think he was going to be able to take the Lombardi Trophy and hoist it from boat to boat uh, during this parade? I was a little worried that he might not make it, but I guess he is the greatest of all time. 
I kind of wish it fell in the water because then what happens? You know, like this, does somebody go in after it? Uh, you know, do they have to wait and, and go down and and, and then like, you know, just the content it would have created. So I kind of wish that was the, the incomplete pass. And and judging by the way he was walking not too long afterwards, I mean, credit him to being able to complete that pass with the trophy. I was surprised that Ed did not take Tom and the Bucks in the Super Bowl. Ed. I didn't take anybody. I told you I just wanted to see a good game. <laughs> I it wasn't a good game, though. Last it really week. wasn't. Unless you're a Bucks fan, it was not a good Super Bowl. No, it was, the game was terrible. I, I wish that I wish they kept it close. But I, what I, um, I'm your thoughts, Robin, on on Brady, on the fact that you know when he was with the Patriots, he wasn't. You know, obviously, a lot of people didn't like him, even though he won. And now he's, you know, getting all this, you know, admiration. What do you think about it now that people are actually like people who? You know, I'm a big, huge Giants fan. They're like, I respect this guy. For years, they're like, I can't stand him, I can't stand him. Now it's different. Why do you think that's happening? Uh, I think part of it is the, you know, the way that the Patriots go about their business and there is no personality at it. And, and, and you also have the links to the stuff that you could call them cheaters or whatnot. Like all that is in, in unison with his relationship with Belichick because there was the flake gate, there was uh, spy gate and, and, and all that while he was there. And then I think when, when he switches, it's just a new perspective. Again, you, you saw a little bit more of his personality. And then I think when you do get to a certain point, when you realize, oh, wait, you know, even though it feels like he's going to be for, here forever, he's not going to be here forever. And I think you've seen that with LeBron in, in the NBA too. You know, some of the haters have, have just like, all right, I, 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 I give up. I surrender. Because, like, you're going to do that their entire career, <laughs> you know, and then they're going to be there and you did it to the very bitter end. So I think you get some of that too, where people are like, oh, "Yeah, what are you gonna do? Deny this? Come on, stop being a, um, a you know what?" Do you think uh, with uh, you know going switching to basketball with LeBron seeing Brady win, do you feel like LeBron is even more motivated now to get number five? Uh, I mean, I think you know with, with guys like that, they have to constantly put another chip on their shoulders somehow, right? So. I, I think they're always going to be self-motivated and a self-starter. But it, it, I think if you're, you know, that you asked Brady and you had him on a polygraph or whatever, you could, you know, you were daredevil. You could check to see if his heart skipped a beat if he was lying. Uh, he would tell you he wanted to win away from Belichick. He wanted to win somewhere else. And and I think, you know, with LeBron, I, I, I'm not sure he didn't use the last dance as fuel last year, right? Like as, as some form of fuel. All right. So maybe, yeah, now the Brady thing could be some for, oh, you guys want to say Brady's the greatest of all greats? All right, watch me do this. I mean, look, he's 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 in this endless debate with Jordan. Um, Brady doesn't quite, you know, doesn't quite have that. They were, we were trying to get the Mahomes thing going, but he, he doesn't really have a, a parallel or, or somebody that, that's argued against him. And it's also not quite the spirit of football, the way it is the, the spirit of basketball to have those debates. But sure, I think a lot of that stuff comes into play. Does LeBron want to win the MVP this year because he should have won some other ones, you know, so he can get, you know, that total up over four? Sure. Does he want to win another title so he could, you know, maybe eventually pass Jordan in, in total titles or, or just add to that argument against Jordan? Sure. Does LeBron want to, you know, be in the Brady back and forth or, you know, one up what Brady just did. I'm, I'm sure that's the case too. You know, he wants to pass Kareem. I'm sure all that stuff's the case because you're dealing with highly, highly motivated individuals. I mean, and you go back to the last dance. I mean, they almost made it a, into a joke a little bit like the Michael Jordan competitiveness stuff, but you, you saw he would try to gain those edges even in a, who was the random dude? Um, was it like LeBradford Smith? Uh, he was, uh, you know, just figuring out I was slighted by this person. So you could get that that little bit of motivation. It's one of the reasons, like in a regular season game, you might see LeBron not not coasting, but not you know in playoff mode. And then he has an interaction with a fan, and all of a sudden he takes over in the fourth quarter because that gave him that little bit of boost he needed right in that moment. When it comes down to you know winning time and championship time, yeah, he's got plenty of motivating factors. Now, Robin, there's another MVP that made the headlines this week, and that's Derrick Rose returning to the Knicks. There's clearly a synergy between Rose and Tibbs, but the former MVP has said that they are kind of like the odd couple at the same time. So question I have for you, is this pairing, the, the pairing that the Knicks have really been missing? Do you think that he can take them from being maybe a low level playoff team to something more? No. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I think a, uh, 
a low level playoff team is a real ceiling for the Knicks. Like, I, you know, I don't act like they are just guaranteed to be a low level playoff team. I didn't mean that completely as an insult, by the way. I, I think, look, Derrick Rose and Tom Thibodeau, you know, let every, anybody love you like Tibbs loves Derrick Rose, right? Like, that, that's great. Um, Rose brings a dimension to the Knicks that they could use. I mean, he's a, um, he, he's a creator, a scorer, some energy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and they didn't, they didn't have too much that maybe pick up the tempo at, at times for them. You know, I, I was a little concerned about their guard minutes being divvied up. We'll see how that works out, but it looked good in the first game. So could Derek Rose, you know, possibly help the Knicks continue to compete to maybe qualify for the playoffs? Yes. Are they going to be above that? No, I mean, look, Derrick Rose is. There was a point in time after Derrick Rose's prime where he was a bad player, almost, and he has reinvented himself since then in a way that has made him an effective player, and I credit him for that later in, in his career. But he, he's limited in the number of minutes he can give you. He's still not in his absolute prime, and the Knicks are still just limited from a talent aspect. I mean, I think credit to the Knicks thus far this year for I think you know, maximizing what they have. I think they've they've probably played as well as they possibly can for the, the personnel that they have. So you don't have Rose winning another MVP with the Knicks is what you're saying. Dude, he's coming off the bench for the Knicks to start. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think he should have won. Yeah. I mean, Le, Le, that should probably be LeBron's MVP anyway. But <laughs> I was going to say, do you feel like uh, the job that uh, – Leon and Wes are doing so far on building the team is a solid job so far. And do you feel like, you know, they're talking about, you know, Bradley Beal, Victor Oladipo, which I think would be a bad move right now. But do um, you think those are moves that the Knicks should make and try to win now? Well, Bradley Beal, yes, if you can make that. I, I don't know what kind of trade that they could construct exactly to get that done. And I also, you know, his agent came out today and said he's not going anywhere. So to the uh, initial question, uh, yes, so far, so good. Uh, you know, th this is – you have to be cautiously optimistic considering who owns the team and considering the history. It just it, – it's not hating. The Knicks have won one playoff series since I graduated from high school. You know, and uh, they, they're just mostly bad. Um, and, and not just, like, bad in, like, you know, not winning games, but, like, in embarrassing fashion at times and all that. But so far, they've been committed to not – getting rid of all their assets. They've been committed to building sort of organically rather than chasing a big name past his prime. I mean, Rose could qualify for that, but the, the Rose deal was on such a small level. They didn't give up much to get him. It looks like they're going to integrate him as part of their building process. So I'm cool with that. Um, you know, they've got quickly who, who has shown some promise. RJ Barrett's played better as, as of late and maybe started turning a, a corner as I think there was a, maybe a few weeks ago, you might've started to get worried about him, but since then he, he's, he's turned a corner. They developed Julius Randall a, a little bit in house. I mean, you always have to mark, you know, look at the market. If, if Bradley Beal becomes available and you, you are able to facilitate that trade, of course you have to look at it, but there's levels to it, right? Like even, you know, some of the other guys will mention Kevin Durant and James Harden and, and uh, LeBron and, and, Kawhi and, and, and guys like that are like a, a level above Beal. Like they're the, the guys. Uh, and then there's um, the Beal level, which is damn good. And, you know, if you can get one of those guys, you get it. And then you go down another level or so before you're talking Victor Oladipo. That's not the kind of move I'm, I'm flipping a bunch of assets for in, in an attempt to win now. Beal is. is, is. And I was going to say, how much luck do you think the Knicks will have if Dallas does not make the playoffs and the, and the Knicks uh, – own Dallas's pick, and now what would the media say after killing the Knicks two years ago for ma uh, for making that trade, three seasons ago for making that trade? Well, I think Dallas will probably make the playoffs. Um, I, I think Dallas got off to a bad start. Uh, Dallas has, you know, their their, their roster is fairly limited. I mean, you look up and down that roster; it's not like laden with talent. But Luca is Luca. I, I give Porzingis a little bit of a everybody's quick, I, and I know I understand why Knicks fans want to like get revenge for the takes on the Porzingis trade. But he's coming off an injury. It's, you know, it, usually it takes guys a few weeks before they really settle in. I, I think his biggest concern right now is defensively moving his feet and, and being able to stay in front of guys, uh, especially the way that the NBA's played now with all the switching and, and having to go out on guards. Um, but I, I think, you know, from a talent standpoint, I'd still buy into him. And, and then, you know, one of the other guys that got in that trade, Tim Hardaway, is one of the key players on that team. So ultimately, I, I think the, the Mavs are, you know, 
in the West, they'll wind up not where they were last year, but I, I think they'll wind up in that six, seven, eight range by the end of the season. So even though Rose was the big story here in the Big Apple, Robin, I think the biggest story this week for the NBA actually comes out of Dallas. And that, of course, uh, centers around the national anthem. So do you agree with the league mandating that all teams play the national anthem? Um, well, there's a lot to unpack there. I, I don't agree. Uh, I also am not mad at it or, or disagree. Like, I understand they're they're trying to not have one team dictate it. They're trying to avoid backlash. Uh, we've actually gotten into, I think, you know, uh, because a certain someone is gone and not on Twitter, uh, you know, we've gotten into a, a less divisive time already. Like, well, I don't think about quite this. You know, it still exists. Every I'm not saying that all that has gone away. You, you don't just put that eight years and whatever preceded that eight years into like a sewage it doesn't and, and it just doesn't exist anymore um there it, it happened for a reason right i mean the capital nonsense garbage uh disgusting stuff was just a, a month ago um but i do feel since you know biden has has come in you, you have a little bit more of a sense of normalcy where you're not like every day what's going to happen today you know like oh my god what is he going to say or what's going to happen you know that kind of thing so I, I feel like that's eased stuff a little bit. So I, I understand where they don't want to go right back into that highly charged um, environment. The idea of not playing the national anthem is one I can get on board with simply because, I mean, there's a few reasons. One, forced patriotism is not patriotism. Um, two, the national anthem is not played before other events. It's not played before you go to dinner or you go to the movie. Yeah, or you go to work, right? Like, it, it, that's just not the – so why are sporting events necessarily different? If, if you're not playing it, you don't have this argument over what people do when you are playing it or a, a, about all of it. And, and I, I get fans weren't in the arena, so that played a part in it being under the radar. But I, I would argue that it shows it's not actually a big deal to people to the extent that they, they make it out to be or it's not actually that big a deal given that nobody knew about it. They did it, you know, for 13 games and, and we just found out about it, right? Uh, I mean, because a lot of these people, and, and I say this with all due respect to the people who do have a, a sincere connection, but there's a lot of people who are are, are faking the funk, you know, and, and they're very performative in, in their anger about it because they're the same people who get up to, to go to the bathroom during the national anthem. They're not sitting in their living room, you know, like this when the national anthem is playing. They're betting the over-under on the national anthem at the Super Bowl, is that respecting it to bet the the duration of it, your money on it? Um, but I, to be quite frank, we can we all just agree to stop fighting about this? Like that's one thing. Which if you want to stand at attention with your hand on your heart and all all of your pride, cool. If you want to kneel to protest, cool. If you want to do neither of those things. Cool. This is not something we should still be fighting about. We're not going to get anywhere. It, it, it's a, a pointless endeavor. That's actually Mark Cuban's argument. He says that the anthem doesn't represent the beliefs of everyone. Yeah, and, and I can see that. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, why was the Drew Brees thing so polarizing, so divisive when it happened, right? It's not that Drew Brees hadn't said that before or other people hadn't said that before. It was the timing. People just saw George Floyd murdered on camera. Right. Like, so there, it was ripe. It was like, right now you're going to say that too, you know? And, and so there is that. Um, then there are other people who they have a, you know, it, it's not always just about the military, but of course there's military connections, whatever personal reasons there may be, right. Who, who do have a, a connection to it. But that's what I'm saying. Like we should all be accepting and understanding it's, it's, it, it's a tradition, but it's a song too. Right. And it can mean what it means to, uh, you know, a lot of people, I, I, I've at times felt awkward during it. I've at times like liked seeing it at the Olympics. Uh, you know, I, I you know, there's always the jokes online. That it doesn't even slap. Right. But, you know, like <laughs> as far as as far as like, is it actually this this topic that people should be at each other's throats over anymore? Well, unless you're being disingenuous and you're using it as some other tool. Right. You're using it to go like, oh, look at these people. They want to get rid of the national anthem or. Or, you know, the other side of whatever that may be, you know, 
if, if people respect it, great. If people don't feel that it, it, it appeals to them and, and they, they uh, want to, to make that known, I totally get that. And that's why I, I understand not playing it. And actually, if you were telling me what I would prefer, it would be that because it would just eliminate all that. Like it, it just, it's not there anymore for, for th- this stuff to continue to go on. Cause we've been having these, these debates for since Kaepernick took a knee, right. It's become, I have a bit about the, the sports talk radio greatest hits album. Right. And it's my Jordan versus LeBron is a money track. Uh, it used to be who was more responsible for the Patriots success, Bill, Belichick or Brady. Should college athletes be paid? Uh, should steroid guys get into the hall of fame? You know, which sport produces the greatest athletes? Uh, you know, whatever, all those various topics that, that you get into when, when you're doing, should Eli Manning be in the hall of fame? And now it's like, should you, you know, what do you think about the national anthem? That's, that's been a, a endless thing for, for years and years. And it's like a, uh, you know, it's like a version of the LeBron Jordan debate where the LeBron Jordan debate is fun. You're not going to get anywhere generally in the LeBron Jordan debate, but I think it's fun. The national anthem debate is not fun. It, it just like brings out the, this gross stuff from people. And, and, and I just prefer if it wasn't uh, something we're fighting over anymore. It, it, has there, is it getting anybody anywhere? No. I mean, even Trump, he, he used to use it as a tool, you know, because he's a manipulator. Whenever it, something was really going on, he had done some horrible crime or whatever, and all of a sudden he'd go like, they're disrespecting the look at the sons of bitches in the NFL. Because he knew that was red meat, right? And, and he could he could get the news cycle and get people to talk about it. And, you know, we shouldn't be playing that game anymore. We're past that. Facts. I just want to uh, switch up to the Brooklyn Nets. Who is the leader of the Brooklyn Nets out of those the big three? And why, you know, I have my own opinion. I just want to hear yours. Hmm. I mean, I would say it's going to have to be Kevin Durant ultimately because he's the he's the best player. Uh, he's the guy you know. I think um, defensively can can uh, change the game the most amongst those three. But it's interesting because he. I, I saw somebody. I, I wish I could give him credit. Like almost said he's their Bosch in a way, not in the level of I think you put LeBron and Wade ahead of Bosch, right? Like, in, but but in the sense that he's the one that just like fits in. And it seamlessly. So, and he's not the most vocal dude. Kyrie, you know, they can go as he goes sometimes because when he's locked in, I mean, that guy is so dangerous. I'm not sure there's any player I'd rather have with the ball in his hands and taking a shot than Kyrie Irving. Like my life was on the line. It might be Kyrie Irving, right? Um, but you can't completely rely on him. Harden has come along and and I think he's tried to be that. You know, he's tried to be that from a – uh from a uh, steadying influence, doing the right things, distributing the basketball and everything. But ultimately, I think, you know, it's going to be the best. It, it could be collaborative effort, but it's it's going to be best if if that comes from your best player, and that's still Kevin Durant. What's been the best part of doing the podcast now, having Kerry Kittles be your running mate in your backcourt? Well, I mean, look, it, it, one – you get somebody who who the fan base loves, right? In in Kerry going back and and obviously played in, in the league and the perspective that comes with that. And then uh, the other is just this team itself. You know, like this year, if you could pick one team, I mean, and I think this is just a, a fair objective statement. Basically, if you could pick one team in all of sports to cover right now, it'd be that team, fandom or not, right? Like that's the team. Every it, it reminds me not to circle back to LeBron again, but it kind of reminds me of covering a LeBron team because having watch LeBron so closely over the years, you see the hysteria that goes around around him. And that's dissipated now because, because of what we mentioned before with him and Brady, but that hysteria is now on the nets. They're that team that everybody covers in a hysterical fashion. So like if they lose, Oh my God, the defense is never, never going to do anything. And then if they win, like the league is on notice, the nets are here. You know, like it's this hysterical way that they're covered. And then you have, the personalities involved where Katie will clap back at people on Twitter. You never know what's going to, you know, you open up Kyrie's IG, what's going to happen next, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the saga of Harden coming over and, and what they're going to do to shore up the roster. Um, the, the, the little squabbles with Knicks fans along the way, you know, there, there's just so many different uh, subplots to that team. So I think that that's one of the cool things is just, it's the most interesting team in sports right now. 
at the worst defensive team I've ever seen, though. I mean, I mean, when I know you watch the games, you must be like, oh my god, the defense is so bad. It's frustrating at times, but look, they're what are they eight and one against teams that came into the game with a five hundred or better record? <laughs> yeah. It's more concerning if they lost to all the good teams and beat all the bad teams. I think it's a little they. They are limited defensively from a roster standpoint. I think they need to make some adjustments there. Um, obviously, some of their best players are, are not known as defensive stalwarts. So when you're putting Kyrie and, and Har- I think Harden's actually played pretty good defense, but Kyrie, he needs to be really locked in like he, he's been in the finals in the past. And then DeAndre Jordan has has wavered, you know, like a lot of that. But some of that's going to be effort. Some of that's going to be how focused you are on a given team. And their best lineup, like the Jeff Phoenix center lineup, their closing lineup, has outscored teams by a lot, like by 20-something points per 100 possessions. So ultimately, I think, do you have do they have to be better consistently defensively to to be the kind of team that we all think they have to be? I think everybody knows that, yes, duh. But I, I think if those three guys are on the floor, they're going to most likely represent the East in the finals. And, and you know, I, I also think, you know, we've seen them beat the Clippers, right? We, we've seen them beat and lock up with, with some of those teams. When it comes to the playoffs – if they can be an above average defensive team, I think, you know, they'll be okay. And, and, and some of that does come along, like I said before, with reacting to every game. Um, I mean, I think any, to a man, all of them would tell you they have to be better defensively. Robin, did you think that the, the Harden trade was the biggest surprise so far from the NBA season, or would you pick another storyline? <sighs> um I mean, I'd have to 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 really think about it. I mean, I, I think the Knicks have been a pleasant surprise where they're at. Um, but yeah, from a blockbuster standpoint, I I, I think you'd have to say that because um, it it kind of quieted. It was a big in the off season, the the Nets aspect of it, and then it felt like when the season started, that kind of died down, and then all of a sudden it, it picked back up again. I, I think you know it's going to be tough to to beat you know basically a top five player in the NBA getting dealt to a, a team that already had two superstars on it. Now, speaking of blockbuster trades, I mean, it, does it fascinate you when you think about Carmelo Anthony and realize that it's it's pretty much almost 10 years? We're a couple of weeks away from the 10 year anniversary of Melo going to the Knicks. I mean, it seems like yesterday. And uh, this is a question that I know will be near and dear to our producer, Randy Cruz, because he just loves him. some Carmelo Anthony. Uh, yeah, that was um, look, I, I was covering the Knicks very closely during that time period. Um I even had Mello do a drop for me on my radio show because I had had a bunch of, you know, I I called them the Knicks fan police at the time. Like if you ever said anything critical of the Knicks, they would come after you. Um, And like they almost had Stockholm syndrome, right? Like they identified with their captor. And the, when, when, cause when I came to, here's a quick story. Like I came to, I've been an NBA head my whole life. Right. I I came to New York in 2004. um, And, you know, I broke into the business and, there wasn't, you know, the NBA wasn't talked about that much. And I'm like, yo, I, I can tell, I can feel already. This is a basketball town at its heart, right? Like it, it wants to be a basketball town. The team just hasn't let it. So I did everything. Like I, I, I was trying like almost to will the Knicks into being more relevant and good. And I was like even rationalizing Isaiah Thomas moves. Like Eddie Curry has scored 20 points in so-and-so straight games, you know, like, um, and, uh, you know, eventually that just wore me down o- over the years. It's one of the reasons, um, you know, I-, I picked up on the Nets. But during that span, there were exciting moments, right? Uh, you know, there was the I-, I think I did a thing with uh, using Bloomberg's trying to recruit LeBron, and then there was Carmelo Anthony trade. I remember the Stat and Mellow, Stat and Mellow, Stat and Mellow, and the the hopes. Lynn Sanity wasn't the anniversary that just happened. That was one of the coolest things uh, I had been around. I mean, I was at the I was at the Super Bowl that year, and I came back to do a Knicks pregame, halftime, and postgame. I didn't actually go to the Super Bowl game itself. I was there for the week, and I came back on the Saturday, and that was the game they played the Nets and Darren Williams. And I remember, you know, Jeremy Lin uh, stretching it, quad stretch, and Dan D'Antoni goes to him like, uh, you know, you might want to be ready to play today. And and then that whole thing unfolded, and and you really just caught the the spirit of it. But yeah, I mean, the Carmelo trade was was a big deal when it went down, and. Uh, Carmelo's had an interesting career overall, right? Like, cause there's, he's a surefire hall of famer. Um, but there was a time where maybe people wouldn't have felt great about it. I think this, the last stint in the, with the Blazers has helped his reputation overall a, a little bit, but he, he's, he's definitely had 
an interesting career where people would, you know, sort of place him in the hierarchy and, and where you hear people argue for him. I, I make fun of Randy because uh, Randy, obviously, we know he loves the Knicks and uh, he posted uh, the Jeremy Lin thing the other day. And that's Randy's championship. Uh, do you see the Knicks winning a championship in your lifetime? I mean, I hope to live a long life. Um <laughs> I mean, based on what though? Like, I can't. Like, I don't want to say it could never happen, but like, based on the evidence at hand and where, they, like, are they close to a championship? No. Have they shown anything as an organization that would make me think that they're built towards the champion? I, I they just have no reason to. But I don't want to like make Knicks fans feel bad by you know. Like, that's just a. Do you think the Knicks are like? What is your evidence to no. that the Knicks are going to win a championship? I worked, I worked for the Knicks for twenty years. I had one opportunity. That was nineteen ninety nine for me, and then I it went downhill as soon as Isaiah came and Jeff Van Gundy left. What I was mean, the uh, was it twenty thirteen that they were good? The fifty four, yeah, yeah, the fifty the fifty four win team when they lost the second round. Yeah, that um, was a pretty good team. Yeah, that was a good team. But you know, I just I like to joke around with Randy because Randy loves to put these moments up, and Randy's still living in in the past. And I'm like, bro, think about the future. I still don't understand how they the, the Jeremy Lin thing fell apart. Like, I get it; his career never like took off. I I, th I think Jeremy Lin was a better player than he got credit for, and just came into some bad situations. And when he finally got into a good one, he, his body broke down, and we'll see if he gets another chance in the NBA. But I just never understood like. You have that happen, and then he just gone. Like it's like striking oil and then plugging the hole. Like I always wonder what would happen if, if he, he he stuck around because it wasn't like you know a trade situation. It was just like you know you have to give him a contract. You see some of the contracts these guys get nowadays. I don't know, you know that was such a huge deal. Um, that was just that was one of those many Knicks things that came along that just made me like just be smarter. You know, you, you know, just <laughs> just be smart. You 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 have the, all this goodwill with your fan base. Why would you Why would you t trash it, Robin? I'm going to steal the last question because we're up against it in terms of time. And you know, we talked about it a bit in the open. And all all jokes aside, but you're a big comic book fan, a big superhero guy. If the world was hanging in the balance, which superhero <laughs> are you calling? The world, like, well, uh, you gotta well, give me hanging in the balance. You have to We're describe how it's hanging in the balance. Like, well, what is the situation in New York hanging in the balance? I mean, obviously, what? Doctor Strange, if you're just giving me this blanket thing because he was the one that could see all the various possible versions of the future, right? And said it's just this one scenario where you have to off yourself, Iron Man, in order for this to go down. So I guess him by that broadest definition, but you have to give me the criteria or the the terms of how it's hanging in the balance. <laughs> to to Worse than it is right now. How about that? I mean, like, is it hanging in the balance because, like, you know, aliens are coming to destroy it? Is it hanging in the balance because, you know, like an asteroid has come in? Is it hanging in the balance because of, uh, um, you know, a, a, an attack on the ground? Like, exactly how is it hanging in the balance? I need I'm to know what your personality is. I guess I have to figure out. I have to come up with my doomsday plan for you, I guess, for that question. Yeah. I mean, if, like, there, if, there's a main, if there's a bank robbery, who you who do you call to save what? the people? Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man. You know, like, even bank robbery, take them out easy, quick. There's not going to be, it's not going to be messy. Nothing like that. Get a few quips in in the, the situation. You know, <laughs> that's uh, Spider-Man for sure. Well, he's Robin Lumberg. He knows a lot about comic books, superheroes, and sports. For more information on him, you can find him at RobinLumberg.com. Thanks, Robin. Robin, later. Appreciate you, man. Great All stuff. Right. So we go, Ed, from one superhero to another. He's actually in the queue. I'm sure a lot of people will know this young fella who's doing big things today, and that, of course, is Smush Parker. Smush Parker, how are you? What's going on? Oh, guys. Long Don't look like you're playing in the NBA, my friend. Looking good. We have to find out who is Smush's favorite superhero. Well, fortunately, fortunate for me, I heard the question before. So I was <laughs> planning my answer for this. Uh, I would either go with, uh, I would go with Thor. Who is a good I, one. I like Thor. Thor. I like Thor. <laughs> either Thor or Wolverine. Wolverine. They're both going to get the job done. That's a fact. That is a fact. Bobby oh, C doesn't know much about superheroes. <laughs> no, I, I, I guess I guess I don't. I didn't come up with the actual plan for for Robin in terms of the doomsday scenario, but I thought it was a cool question to ask him since he's someone that loves 
again, comic books and superheroes. And, uh, you know, Smush, I don't know how much of the podcast you've watched because I know Ed is really not like your favorite guy and all more your favorite guy. <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on every on every episode, I love to put one of my favorite jerseys behind, especially kind of runs the theme of the show. And tonight, paying homage to the great Smush Parker. And I have had this jersey since you played with the L.A. Lakers. So it's not like I'm just Listen, jumping I'm on the bandwagon. I don't have any more Lakers jerseys. I gave them all away. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, Ed, uh, didn't get one, right? Ed did not get a, a Smush Parker jersey, correct? I, uh, when yeah. Smush came to New York to play, when, when he was on the Lakers, he came to New York, I asked him, can I get his game jersey? He looked at me and said, who are you? <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. Me and Edgar go, me and Edgar go well, way back. Long time. Well, we get on Ed every single podcast, Randy and I, and we say to him, can you do two things for us? One, create some sort of backdrop like the beautiful one that you have behind you. And I know that you know those fans that are listening in tonight – with the audio stuff, we're not going to see it, but you can check it out on YouTube. You got this great backdrop, but Ed refuses for a backdrop, and he refuses to have a microphone, even though he wants to do this podcast every week. I smush. I said I will not get a backdrop until I see you, which I know it's going to be soon. Refing the NFL an NBA game. Okay. And I know that's and I know that's going to happen, and that's my that's challenge to soon. you. That's gonna be it's simple. Gonna be Bobby soon. C. We'll say about that guy. He he lives a very humble life. He's a very <laughs> yeah, humble guy. He does. <laughs> You know, Smush, you made my week, too, on IG. You know, a little bit of the shout-out back to the days, you know, the glory days of street ball, talking about the nicknames. And um, it was great to see you give a shout-out to Hoops in the Sun and myself. You know, we used to call you so many things, and one of those nicknames, of course, was the Aviator for your uh, brilliance when it comes to dunking a basketball. We wanted to talk to you tonight. Ed and I kind of wanted to take a stroll down memory lane, talk about your great career. And uh, for me, you know, I, I think your story, I don't know if you'll consider doing it at some point, but definitely deserves either a book or maybe a documentary or a film because um, it's really a remarkable story. I mean, for those that might not know Smush's story, I'm basically giving you the Cliff Notes version, played high school basketball in Queens after really being – uh, arguably the city's greatest street ball star in some time, ended up going to Southern Idaho, then played basketball at Fordham University, undrafted but signed with the Cavs in 2002-03. Then a slew of stops in his professional career, plays in the D-League overseas, in and out of the NBA, before finally settling in as the starting point guard for the Lakers in 2005. Was that a good kind of like uh, Cliff Notes version, Smush? Yeah, that was a great Cliff, uh, cliff Close. Little, 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 little. Cliff Notes version, that's a tongue, tongue twister right there. Um, you covered all the bases. I was, uh, I wasn't the great, a great street ball player. I was, I was among many, and uh, it was uh, because of my upbringing. You know, it was because of my environment. It was because of New York City. I got to, you know, where I was able to uh, get to. You know, it was, a, it was playing against the competition that I played against every day here in street ball that made me the player that I am today. You know, so, I, just, um, I think of those you know, days at West Fourth, you know, and Hoops uh -huh. in the Sun. I think of those days yeah. at West Fourth and Hoops in the Sun. I mean, it's definitely a big part of your story. Definitely, shout out to Hoops in the Sun, West Fourth Street, uh, rec, the rec leagues. You know, to remember for me, the playing in the rec leagues was like playing. It was uh, the first AAU leagues for me. You know, when it was uh, YMCA versus YMCA or recreational center versus recreational center. You know, I remember I was playing for the McBurney Y. And we used to play against the Bedford Wild all the time, you know, Brooklyn USA guys, you know, and that was, you know, my AAU uh, era. Smush, you played um, in one of the best uh, seasons in street ball history, and you played with Robin Lumberg's favorite rapper of all time, Jay Z. Um, can you talk about, you know, one, how you was recruited by to play for Jay Z's team, and can you talk about that season that ended in the blackout? Um, that the game that never played, and who would have won if that game would have happened? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't remember exactly how I was recruited to play with uh, Jay Z's team, but I will say, um, just just for the record, I guess um, you know John Strickland, may you uh, rest in peace. Put in a good word. You know I was playing with a 
you know, a bunch of actually a lot of guys that played for Jay's team used to play for Gold's Gym back in the day. I don't know if you remember, you know, uh, Gary Prince's Gold's Gym, you know, um, and you know, I played with John Strick on Gold's Gym, and uh, I guess he put in that word for me. Um, I think we would have won. I believe we would have won. I was there at that game. I was on the bus. You know, I was. I, you know what? I want to go on record. I want to go on record by saying I was the only player to get off the bus that day. I don't know. Wait, I, were you there, Edgar? I filmed it. I was there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was the only player on Jay's team that, that night to get off the bus and actually walk into the park. So I actually witnessed, you know, Fat Joe and his crew and his, his mob and, you know, all of his guys that he had on the court. And it was crazy because he had about a thousand dudes with him. Yeah. They, they they have nowhere to sit. They were all on the court. Yeah. They were on both benches. Um, you know, so it, it there was there couldn't have been a game that went on. Yeah, but one thing, uh, you are partly responsible for uh, you and John Strickland in a game where Jay Z came out with his favorite line: "Is Strick finish your breakfast?" Uh, do yeah. you remember that? Situ- do you remember the play and the whole situation? How it happened? I remember the play in the situation because uh, I get reminded about it uh, often. And then uh, on social media, they they play that that one clip where I, you know John Strickland dropped a, a bounce pass behind his back to me on on the baseline, and I went for a reverse dunk, and I came up short. And uh, you know uh, they called the timeout, and John Strickland looked at me and was like, "Finish your breakfast." <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, you know, <laughs> yeah, he was like, young boy, finish your breakfast. And I guess Jay-Z heard it, um, heard it and then put it in his, in his, uh, in his, um, his rhyme. But people don't know the very next play after that, John Strickland dropped the pass, the same kind of pass to me, the very next play. And I went up for the same reverse dunk and I, you know, I finished my breakfast. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Smush, if, if you could do it all over again, would you take the same path in your professional career? Would, would, would there be anything that you would do different? Um, I think the path that I took was the only path that I that I that I had. You know, um, and just to give you a quick summary of why my path was the way it was, is because one, I didn't grow up playing organized basketball. I didn't play my first organized basketball until I was thirteen. So I really am a product of the street. Like Smush Parker is street ball, not the, not the, you know, the tournament street ball, but actual playing in the street. Like I played growing up in the street uh, parks, different Tillery Park in Brooklyn, West Fourth Street, um, various different parks here in Brooklyn. And it wasn't until I moved to Manhattan, I played in Carmine Recreational Center for the first time when I was thirteen. And that's when I, then that's when I started to get. Indoctrinate, indoctrinated into organized ball. So I didn't have that long, you know, um, AAU career. I didn't play my first AAU tournament until I was a uh, junior slash senior in high school. Played one year, one one AAU tournament with uh, AIM High. You know, shout out to AIM High, uh, Vincent Smith, Kevin, uh, Kevin uh, Jackson, and uh, Kenny Smith for, you know, giving me that opportunity. Playing in the backcourt with Tyler Brown, um, but when you hear about guys like Tyler Brown and Andre Barrett and Old Cook, they had extensive AAU, you know, uh, exposure. No, I didn't. So when I, you know, when I came onto the scene, I was behind. I was behind the eight ball, so to say. You know, but I'm, you know, God, God gave, God gave me grace. He uh, allowed me the opportunity to showcase my skills and. You know, one platform after the next. I just went and played ball, and I I proved to people I could play. Ed is ready to do the documentary, Smush. Whenever you say go, Hard to Guard Media is ready to be on board and do the doc, the official Smush Parker doc. Uh, You definitely have a great story, uh, Smush. And, like, one of the things that I I love about you um, that I think needs to be promoted more is your give back to the kids. Um, You know, you have a foundation, and, you you know, you – organically growing it every year has gotten bigger. Can you just talk about that? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for pointing that out. You know, I have a nonprofit called Smush Inspires. And, um, 
And it's exactly what it sounds like. Smush inspires. Um, you know, uh, I, I host free basketball camps and clinics for the for the inner city kids who don't have the resources to either, you know, make it to an NBA game or to, you know, attend a, uh, one of these high profile athletes basketball camps. I, I, I uh, host them for free. Um, and that whole, you know, Smush inspires, you know, it, it, it stemmed from actually me meeting Anthony Mason when I was 13. And, you know, I don't remember too many days when I was, you know, 13 years old, but I remember that day. And uh, the reason why I remember that day is because he played in the NBA. He was playing in the NBA at the time for the New York Knicks. And he was somewhere where I wanted to go. Where he was somewhere where I wanted to be. And here I am, fast forward, I'm in the NBA. And I'm like, if Anthony Mason could create that memory for me at 13, why can't why 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 can't I I can use my same platform to do that for you know these kids in the in the city who might not ever meet an NBA player ever so I um uh, I'm 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 trying to you know pay it forward you know to all the knowledge that I was given you know growing up I'm trying to give it give it all away I don't want to die with all the all the knowledge that I have all this uh basketball IQ that I have I want to I just want to give it all away and I do it through Smush Inspired. That's beautiful. You know, Smush, I mean, I, I think we just talked about it. I mean, obviously, act one for you, this incredible pro career, but now act two and even act three are things like, you know, the AAU team, Smush Parker Elite, and what you just talked about with Inspires and, and also the refereeing. I mean, as, as Ed said at the top of this interview, uh, kind of giving back to the game of basketball in a different way. Oh, yeah. A lot of people don't know that I'm uh, actually um, going to get back to the NBA as an NBA official, you know, that's what I'm working towards. It should be a, a two, three year process, but it, it's going to happen. I'm going to make that happen. Can you talk about like the help? I, I heard you earlier um, on Clubhouse and you gave flowers to uh, the relationship you had with Chris and Chin. And can you tell, uh, can you tell the people who are watching the impact that she's had on your life? Okay. Listen, Chris and Chin, uh, I think everybody needs or has a Krista Chin in their life, you know, and it's just that external mo mother, you know, that external, you know, person that just, you know, loves unconditionally, you know, and for me, uh, Miss Chin, um, I don't like, I don't, I feel funny calling her Krista Chin, although I have that kind of relation, I, I call her Miss Chin. Uh, she was that, um, that, that, that mother and that, NBA mother for me, you know, and as you, as you heard me say on Clubhouse, you know, she was my ally, you know, I, you know, I briefly said that, you know, I kind of worked my way through the back door to get into the NBA, so I wasn't, you know, met at the NBA with the, uh, the red carpet rolled out, I wasn't met with the, you know, I wasn't drafted, so I just, I never got the, the, the hat handed to me and walk, the walk across the stage, you know, I didn't get all of that. But, you know, I worked my way organically into the NBA. So I didn't get that whole introduction into the, like the NBA family. But one thing I can say is when I did come to the NBA and I, you know, I went to the NBA offices, Chris Chin was the, you know, the first one to, you know, kind of, you know, take me in and make me feel comfortable and, you know, make me feel like I was somebody that, you know, should appreciate where I was and they appreciate appreciated having me. Smush, uh, I want to talk a little bit too about you know about this clothing line that you got going on. I love the love the swag, love the gear, definitely love the logo. Was hoping that you could fill the fans in about that. You need to buy me one. Uh, Tell me where to get it. <laughs> you know, I hate the I hate the line. Uh, I hate the phrase clothing line because it's not really a clothing line. Um, to, to, we, we we spoke about Smush Inspires, you know. So that that was the main. That's that's my main thing. I want to give back. And giving back, you know, I, I, you know, as you guys know, you need sponsors and do, uh, donators, people who donate to your cause. So I created a brand, and right now I'm I'm branding myself a certain way so that I can attract, you know, certain sponsorships and uh, donations. But I'm not making clothes to like kind of, you know, say it's a clothing brand. It's more of a brand that I'm trying to, you know, bring attention to so that I can give back to the kids. You know, but yeah. I created a logo, you know, this is me, the silhouette right here. That's me in the, oh, me in the background over here, Duncan. Uh, 
You know, I got hats, I got hoodies, t-shirts, shorts, headbands, you know, again, it's all to create, you know, just some, some, you know, some, uh, give back, some help for me to, you know, kind of inspire more you, not just here in New York City, but across the nation. So Smush, if, uh, if people want to give back uh, and help um, with your organization, how can they do that? Uh, right now, my uh, my website is under COVID reconstruction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, you guys can follow me on uh, my Instagram handle, uh, Smush Parker Elite, uh, Smush underscore Parker underscore Elite. And then from there, you guys can, you know, branch out to my Smush Inspires. And then I have my catalog page, Rock With Smush on IG. Um, and all my merch I post on, 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 on those pages and you can contact me directly. And if you're interested, you, you know, you just, you know, slide in my DMs. Pause to you guys, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Smush, I want to take the combo back to some basketball, especially after that comment, and uh, talk a little bit more about, you know, breaking into the league. Because for me, one of the things that also stood out for you, because just an amazingly talented player, very athletic, but you also made that transition from being a shooting guard in the high school college days to playing point guard in the NBA. I mean, what was that transition like? Well, if you know me, you the the the, the actually the transition – the transition was being the two guard. I was always a pass first, shoot second kind of guy. My mentality was always I'd rather a, an assist than two points. But, you know, um, unfortunately, in the game of basketball, you know, people who who get assists and run the offense really don't get acknowledged that much. You have to be a, you're kind of forced to be a scorer, you know, especially early in your career um high school college to kind of get us to get recognized so i did i did some you know scoring when i was in high school i did some scoring at the co college level but i'm more point guard minded than uh, uh two guard shooting minded do the kids end up asking you the most about those laker days i mean obviously you played for a few teams in the nba but i guess that affiliation with such an historic franchise and, and sharing the backcourt with a player like kobe bryant does that seem to come up the most when people ask you about your career Oh no, that's the only that's the uh, only thing that comes up. Um, like you said, I played for uh, the Lakers, the most historic franchise in NBA history, alongside uh, one of the goats to ever lace up, you know, uh, his sneakers in the game. Um, run by, you know, the uh, the Hall of Famer, maybe the arguably the best coach in NBA history, most decorated, of course, and uh, Phil Jackson. Um, but I would say the Lakers actually was the first time I actually had the opportunity to actually really play. You know, I played for the Cleveland Cavaliers, you know, at the time, I don't want to say it, but we were a pretty bad team. Uh, there was the years, the building years before LeBron James got there. I played for the Detroit Pistons the following year. You know, they just won a championship. I played behind the great Chauncey Billups and a uh, longtime vet, Lindsey Hunter. So I wasn't getting much playing time there. Then I, played a stint with the Phoenix Suns behind Steve Nash. So I, I wasn't really getting, you know, recognized. Um, but I was still, you know, in the league. You know, I was working. And when I finally got my, uh, my, my opportunity to shine in L.A., I took full advantage. You know, my, my, my uh, work ethic, um, I was able to uh, just outplay the point guards that they brought there and, you know, had the opportunity to play in the backcourt, one of the best. That's much. Do you, um, Kevin Garnett recently came out with a comment uh, about, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of players couldn't play in today's game. Do you wish that you played in today's era compared to when you came in uh, years back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, listen, I believe the guards, in the era that I played in and the guards that preceded me would destroy this guard oriented league now with no bigs. Like we had to we had to play in a in an era where there was still centers and center footers and 
six ten guys, power forwards, clogging the paint. And we were still able to get to the basket and a finish and you know um score. Right now there's no there's no bigs. Everything is just an open open floor. It's just open. I think I think guys I think guys I you know what I'm gonna speak for myself. I would love playing in this era. You guys know my track record. You know I was going, you know, into the Giants and dunking dunking over seven footers. You mean to tell me that there's no seven footers in the league now? Come on. Come on. The game has definitely changed very much, Mush. I mean, even with, I think, the three-point shot playing such a, a pivotal role in every NBA game, more so than ever before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The uh, the game has definitely changed. And um, I want to I wanna ask you guys. I always ask people this. I always ask people this. I want to know if you guys know your basketball. Who changed the game of basketball into this into this style of play that we uh, we have today? I'm going to go, I'm going to go, well, I mean, are we going more current or are you going to say more back in the day? Who changed the game to the style of play that we're playing today? I'm going to say Steph Curry. Nope. Um, uh, that's actually a good question. Uh, I would actually probably say the Houston Rockets. I, I, I'll no. say the Phoenix, Phoenix Suns and Houston Rockets, either or. The Phoenix Suns, the Steve, the Dan Tony, Steve Nash, Phoenix Suns. That's the, the, this is the executive style of play that they played the two years that uh, Steve Nash won the MVP and the two years that we faced them in the playoffs. They they play small ball. They played seven seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not at the center. That, yeah, that, that <laughs> game plan was to, to outscore guys, outscore teams, excuse me, by shooting threes instead of twos. They, they played, go ahead. I'm just going to say, don't you don't you think that over the course of, of these you know past several decades, you've seen certain players that have done that from time to time? I mean, even somebody like Pistol Pete Maravich kind of played similar styles of basketball going, you know, again, going back um, to the 70s. But um, for me, I thought the first player that kind of really transcended this part of the game, really, honestly, was was Steph Curry. Oh yeah, no, no question. Steph definitely um, influenced a lot of the game now, where it's it's three point oriented. But as far as uh, team play and that, strategy, that sounds you know it, it, the strategy changed when Dan Dan Tony's uh, coaching style. His his coaching method was we want threes, you can have twos. They weren't they they wasn't gonna foul us, they wasn't gonna play no defense, but they were gonna outscore us by shooting threes. See, the first time I actually saw that style of game was actually in the college ranks, and that was LMU with Hank Gathers and Bo Kimball and Paul Westhead. But I mean it took, you know, it, it probably took until Westhead was um, you know, kind of more of an influence in the NBA. Uh, with his speed game when he was with the Lakers and won a championship with Magic Johnson and Kareem. And even at that point, uh, not exactly the same as that Suns, uh, Suns team that you bring up with, uh, with Nash and company. Well, you, you got me there. <laughs> you got me there. I don't know too much. I don't know that much history, but again, just to my knowledge, you know, and uh, watching over the years, it's been, you know, pretty much big oriented. Even when I was playing in the league, it was, you know, big or uh, still a big oriented game. You throw it into the post, you spread the court, you wait for the ball to come back out, then you get your opportunity. It, it wasn't until, you know, um, to my knowledge, you know, the Phoenix Suns, you know, they went with uh, Boris Dio at the four, Stoudemire at the five, you know, Sean Marion at the three, you know, um, Ray Jean Bell at the two, and Steve Nash at the one where they played five five outside players no post-up players and they all just ran they all just found that 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 three-point line and, it's, and then and then uh they stopped playing they started playing boris d at the five they show marion at the four so that they could get that you know outside shooting going and they it's okay they, Smush. i'll give the point to ed for tonight I, it's okay i'll take the l it's fine you got it <laughs> Now, Smush, I just you know, last question. I was just like you know, obviously trying to be a ref. Um, 
can you just talk about how you know you're keeping up and you're ref and where and and are you taking a program with the NBA or you know anything like that? Uh, definitely. Um, there is a program. Well, when I retired from playing basketball, which, which, which was uh, not too long ago, about three years ago, I uh, cut my dread my dreads off. I don't know if you guys remember the, the the locks that I had. You know, I was like, you know, I gotta go into this NBA office. Let me cut my hair off. So I can look the part, you know, I went in there and I told them what I wanted to do so that they're, they're well aware of um, my um, my goals, their aspirations and getting back to the NBA. And they're very supportive in uh, my journey. Um, there is a, a program for NBA players to uh, enter certain avenues to stay within the NBA. And um, I'm not in that yet. You know, I had to get my certificate, which I got my MBA certificate, uh, which I got uh, about a year ago. And since then, I've just been uh, doing high school, junior high school games, corporate league games. Um, um, yeah. And as a, you know, right now, we know with COVID, you know, sports has been kind of non-existent, you know, not just here in New York City, but all across the nation. Um, but I live in New York City and basketball has been non-existent. So I'm just kind of, you know, in the in the waiting um, area now. So, you know, for sports to open back up so I can get back into these programs. Smush, uh, Ed and I appreciate you taking the time tonight. Definitely good stuff here on the podcast. And uh, Ed and I spoke about it. We want to get out there on a bicycle and see if we can ride cross country with you one of these days because we could use the exercise during COVID. And I will come call you tomorrow and get me a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Listen, when the world opens back up, just invite me to one of your bowling nights, man. That's all I got I you. Done deal. I told you I got you. I haven't done anything in over a year and change. <laughs> I, like I, said, but I, am just, doing I am doing something kind of dope. I'll call you tomorrow about it. It's virtual. Right, man. It's virtual. It was, great, you know, it was great catching up with you guys, Bobby C. Thanks again for, for the support. I know we've been trying to, you know, link up you know, on Instagram. But it's good to, you know, uh, hear your voice again. Your it's voice. Great to see you, Smush. I got the jersey. That's all that matters. <laughs> great to see you, Smush. Have a good one, man. Later. All right. Have a good night. All right. I had a great podcast tonight, man. Whether you call it Step in the Arena or Step into the Arena, it was a really I good podcast. I told you why it's Step into the Arena. Because there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got to change all the graphics then. We're definitely not uh, pubbing the right podcast. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we're going to keep it because that's what Randy called the step, step in the arena, so it's going to be step in the arena. <laughs> well, we definitely wanted to shout out again our guests this evening. Big shout out to Robin Lumberg and, of course, NBA veteran Smush Parker. Uh, for Edgar Burgos, I'm Bobby C. Ed. I guess I'll see you next Thursday. I don't know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Next Thursday, 9, 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock. Sounds like a plan. Till next time, folks, step in the arena. Edgar Burgos, Bobby C. signing off. We'll see you next time. Later.